All right, Mono Amigos, we have got an amazing show for you today. We're doing our guitar series here. Today we're going to feature the music by Gary Kane and the Gary Kane Band. And we're going to sit down in a virtual conversation here with Gary Kane in just a few minutes and talk about his guitar influences and specifically guitar influences for twangadelic blues of funk. He's a blues he's a blues guitar player, uh, has played a whole bunch of shows, and is one of the best guitar players I personally have ever seen perform live. We joked earlier on the Mono A Mono show that he was number four in Canada. I would like to see someone who's as good. But we're going to get into it. We'll get into a bunch of things about his guitar playing in just a minute here. Hey, how's it going, man? Interrupted your presidential uh, inauguration <laughs> party. No, I actually I didn't watch much of it. I'm so happy that Trump's gone, but uh, I didn't really watch a whole lot of it. It's all the same, you know. We're the greatest country. We're gonna do this and that. So, so whatever. Just just get Trump out of there, and then I'll I can not watch for the next four years. <laughs> yeah. To start, if you could reaccount what um, what attracted you to the guitar, and maybe where you learned how to play. Sure. Well, my mom had a an old acoustic classic classical guitar sitting around at home, and I, I played piano before I played guitar a little bit because we also had a piano. And so I, I dug music. I like playing music. Um, and so I think I just got curious about the guitar and started picking up and playing with it, really. Uh, and then what really got me excited about the guitar was ACDC. I got into, when I was a little kid, I got into ACDC. And I was just obsessed with Angus Young and with ACDC. So um, I started just listening to ACDC songs and picking them out by ear on a classical acoustic. And wow. kind of just went from there for the, for, I think for a fair amount of time, I just played nothing but ACDC. And then finally, my parents thought, you know, you're really into this. Maybe we should get you some lessons. And so I went and took lessons um, for a short while. And then um, I think my teacher ended up leaving town or something. And I couldn't find another teacher I liked. So from that point forward, I basically just taught myself. And it was just a matter of I would find songs I really liked and guitar players that really made me excited. And I would try to figure out what they were doing, you know, and play along with the albums. You know, put the tape on and and rewind it and play it, rewind and play it. And I wore out so many tape players just by hitting, you know, rewind, play, rewind, play. Uh, and that was it, just kind of lifting licks and and that kind of got me off to the races. So, you you mentioned Angus Young, um, which is is a very different genre from twangadelic blues of funk. <laughs> uh, what were what, what were some of the other influences that got you kind of more playing blues guitar? Uh, well, I went through a real rock phase. So I went through like ACDC and then I was into like, I was into Metallica pretty heavily for a while. I was into like uh, Joe Satriani. I went through a little phase with him and uh, stuff like that. But then on a family vacation, uh, my parents gave me some money to buy some tapes at a tape store and I bought uh, Steve Ray Vaughan, Texas Flood. <laughs> And then that was just like, I took a complete right turn. And uh, I remember we were, I think we were in like Florida for vacation. And from that point forward in the vacation, I just sat in the rental car all the time with the tape player. And like, they were going to see stuff. And I was like, no, I'm just going to sit, leave the keys. I'll just sit here and play this tape. Because it was like, wow. like being hit by lightning. I loved it so much. Um, and actually ACDC, the old ACDC is actually very blues. Like you've listened to old tunes like Ride On. It's a slow 12-8 blues, like a lot of their stuff was just blues shuffles. Like this is the Bon Scott era stuff, right? That's what I was kind of into. Um, but yeah, so once I saw or heard Steve Ray Vaughan, I was hooked. And then, of course, that led me back to Albert King because he was a huge influence on him. And I started listening to other guys like Albert Collins, B.B. King, stuff like that. Um, I think Albert King is my favorite pure blues guitar player. Um, and I obviously got into Hendrix through that and... Uh, and then I went on a real long Steve Ray Vaughan phase where I was just obsessed with him. I tend to do this. I find a player that I really dig and I just obsess over him. Right. And so I was in a Steve Ray Vaughan. I tried to learn everything I could about him and, you know, um, try what kind of picks does he use all this, you know, all this stuff. Oh, wow. And then once Stevie died, it was kind of like there was a whole bunch of imitators 
and not many people doing something new and exciting. With it was all people just regurgitating what he'd done. So I kind of got a little frustrated with that and was trying to find something new. And then uh, Chris Duarte came along. I don't know if you've heard of him, but for me, he's kind of like he was really strongly influenced by Steve Ray Vaughan, but totally had his own thing. And for me, it was kind of he was a huge influence by his playing, but by just kind of his example, I kind of saw that you can do your own thing with stuff and you should really kind of take things and turn them on their heads and be experimental and, you know, and uh, do whatever you want with what's come before you. So <clears throat> at that point, I got a lot less into trying to do it exactly as it was done by people I like and try to do my own thing with it. Okay. And, uh, and then I also got into a guy named Danny Gatton, who just blew me away. Um, and he was kind of like a telly, chicken picking, rockabilly, you know, guy. Um, so that kind of got me my twangy side. And uh, and after that, I just, every time I found somebody I really liked, I just tried to figure out what it is about their playing I really liked. And I tried to figure out a way to incorporate that into what I do. So. Okay. So wh when you're when you're saying doing something new, you're talking about like the actual, I guess the, it, you need to know a bit of musical theory behind that to be able to tell what they're doing or just, just based upon sound, you're listening to what they're doing. Like, I, I guess my my question is, is it more uh, from a sound point of view, like they've got different effects and doing things, or they're actually playing the blues riff different, differently than somebody before them? Yeah, it's more the second part. Uh, I mean, tone's a big thing too, but it's more the with the notes they're playing and what they're doing with it. So, uh, like, for instance, with Steve Ray Vaughan, he had a, a certain style, right, and it was, you know, the way he he played was incredible. Um, but then people that came after him a lot of time just tried to do exactly what he was doing. And yeah. they took like big chunks of his vocabulary and just kind of regurgitated it. And it's like, that sounds great. It's Steve Ray Vaughan. Steve Ray Vaughan was great, but you're yeah. just doing Steve Ray Vaughan, right? And there's some people are, they reach a level where they're just, there's nobody ever going to do Steve Ray Vaughan better than Steve Ray Vaughan. There just isn't, right? He, that is why he's so great. It's because he did that and it's done. Like there's never going to be a better Albert King than Albert King. So at some point, you're going to have to try doing something that isn't copying and is influenced by it. So, like, for instance, with Chris Duarte, what I found is he took a lot of the different um, uh, uh, stylistic things and, and some of the licks and stuff that Steve Ray Vaughan played, but he would completely rearrange them. And he, he would jump uh, up an octave at times I would never think to. Like, he would do stuff like Steve Ray Vaughan would never do. And that's kind of what it's about. It's about trying to figure out, okay, this is really cool. And how do I be influenced by this, but still do something different? That's that's me about it, right? It's kind of like if it like like if you saw somebody whose ideas you really like, like a public speaker, right? And you thought this guy's really influencing me. I like the his ideas about economics or whatever, right? But if you just went out on tour and you regurgitated his speeches note for like word for word, yeah, it was nothing. It's great to incorporate his ideas and add your own, but you don't want to just regurgitate what somebody else's. Right, okay. you're, yeah. you're a tribute band at that point more <laughs> yeah. than, than your own yeah, band. Yeah, so, and I mean, sometimes it's great to literally quote something from a tune, like, I'll play like a little passage from a Stevie tune or from a Chris Duarte tune or from somebody I really like as like a quote, right? But I won't play it all night long, but I might just throw in like a one bar phrase. And it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like an homage or whatever, but it's kind of like a tip of the hat to like something you really loved in that, you know, inspired you you know what i mean and i love to hear when people do that like when somebody plays a quote from something and i go hey i know that that's an old you know and then i kind of know hey that guy has listened to that same album i did you know yeah so, uh, uh yeah that's kind of how it works nice so with 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 trying to dissect like all these these players and how they play and you trying to to incorporate parts you must have learned so you were saying also that you learned piano before guitar do you have you must have like a good uh, music theory background to fall back on? I do. At this point, I would say I do. Uh, certainly back when I was playing piano, I mean, I was I don't know how old I was when I was playing piano, maybe like seven or something. Okay. <laughs> and basically, my mom would just kind of sit me down, show me something, and then that would keep me busy for a while. And when I was done that, she'd come back and show me something else. So like literally, it was like, you know, Michael Rowe, the boat ashore and like, you know, different yeah. you know stuff like that. Um, but I also, I did go to college for uh, music as well, where I learned a lot of theory stuff. Initially, I just learned by ear and I didn't know the theory. 
later when I took lessons, it was kind of like they were, I learned what it was I was doing, but I, I didn't kind of like, so theory is a weird thing because some people think, you know, some people say you don't need to know any theory. Like Jimi Hendrix didn't know theory. Right. Um, and that's true. But I mean, would Jimi Hendrix have been worse if he knew more theory? Like certainly not. Right. Like uh, just as like, you're not going to be a good speaker by understanding verbs and adjectives, but it's not going to make you a worse speaker or writer. Right. Like, so sometimes it's handy to know those rules. Um, but it's also important to understand those rules are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. So it's not like something sounds good because it is this formula for music theory. The formula of music theory comes because this thing sounds good. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. music yeah. theory describes music. It doesn't, you don't start with theory and then build your music around those blocks kind of thing. Yeah. So, wow. um, but I would, ne I would always encourage people, you, you are always well served to learn what's going on under the hood of music. It's not going to, don't fall victim to the thought that I'm going to be somehow less soulful or less, you know, groovy if I understand what's going on. It's not the case. Well, I've, I've awesome. played in bands with people that don't, like literally don't know any theory. Um, and some people are good players that don't know any theory. In a band context, it can be limiting because it's the language you use to communicate to people about, what, about music, right? Like you can't describe what it is you know, like there's certain nomenclatures and number systems and stuff like that. And if you don't have that, it makes it difficult to communicate with other people about what you're doing. Whereas if everybody understands basic theory, you can go in and go, okay, it's like, it's a one, six, two, five in B flat and we can play. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas yeah. if not, you kind of look at each other and like, what do you call this? What do you call this? Right. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely useful. Nice. When you said that, it reminded me of the uh, back to the future where uh, he jumps on stage and just says <laughs> yeah. to them, uh, I, I forget exactly the line, but he just says, yeah, try and follow along, and then they just jump into it. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> um, so composition, uh, if you're writing a song, and this might not be the best one, because I feel like uh, this, this track of yours is um, kind of a show-off track. I'm talking uh, Twang Strut. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I feel like the first time you were on Mono A Mono, you had an earlier version of Twang Strut. And then this is a, a, I guess, professionally recorded version on your album. Yeah. And so maybe you don't want to talk to this song in particular, but if you're writing a, a track, do, do you like do you have the is it based upon a practice where the, the, the uh, riffs kind of come to you and then you put uh the the rest of the arrangement together or do you go in and you're trying to build something uh the reason why i say twang strut may not be a good one is because i feel like it's a bunch of different blues riffs that you're showing off that you're able to do i don't know if i'm correct about that but uh well there's yeah there's lots of stuff in there i guess we kind of in that one we go in a couple different fields and stuff so um in that one, it's kind of, uh, and actually, I've got a live version of that out now that's that I like better than this one, but that we did at the uh, Kingston Blues Festival. But uh, that tune, I actually, I I wrote that tune after I um, heard Danny Gatton the first time, and that kind of inspired me to do something different. It kind of just gave me an idea of like, wow, I really like this twangy kind of style, and I and I didn't really think of myself as that type of player. Because most of the kind of twangy players, I mean, I really remember liking Roy Clark, Roy Clark on Hee Haw when I was a kid, which <laughs> is like a bluegrass. I love that. But I hadn't really heard really good twangy pickers, or maybe I just hadn't been open to it at that point. But then at the right time, I heard him. And then I realized, no, this is actually something that, like, is it, it, this is me for sure. Like, I'm, I'm definitely in the, into this, right? Yeah. Um, like, I would say, like, death metal is just not me. Like, I just, I'm never going to be a death metal player. Right? But I've heard this, and I was like, man, this is, like, something I got to explore. So I decided to try and just incorporate my existing blues knowledge into a more twangy thing. And so it is a blues form, except for the bridge. Um, but it, to answer your question, so uh, Writing tunes, it's it's different all the time. Sometimes I'll just come up with a riff, and that can happen by accident when I'm practicing. I might actually just stumble across something and go, "Hey, that's kind of a neat thing," and then I'll try and you know flesh it out and work it into a, a riff. Um, sometimes I'll just get an idea in my head, and then I'll I'll record it on my phone. Like I've got one of those laps that just records you, and I'll sing it into the phone, um, which I would recommend anybody do because you'll think, "Oh, I'll remember that," and like you will, yeah. you won't remember. Yeah, you never remember it. 
Um, and then I also have recording software where I'll just record it on my computer if I get an idea. And I'll record bits and bobs of stuff and think I can go back and use that later. But usually it'll be like a, a riff or something that I'll, I'll, um, I'll come up with and try and build a song around. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. It's, it's never the same, uh, the same kind of thing. Um, usually I'll just sit with the guitar and jam until something comes up that I think maybe I should make a song out of. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. Because yeah. you used to, I don't know, I, I'm not that great of an Instagrammer, or maybe it's Facebook. I don't know. I'm not that great at either of them. But <laughs> you used to, on one of the two of them, post just like some crazy practice jams uh, yeah, yeah. all the time. I don't know if you're still doing that or, or if you have I, I do. Yeah, I still do. I haven't done it for a while and I really should. Um, I don't know why that is, but, um, but yeah, I mean, when I practice, I often just pick something and explore it. So I might be, I might think like, uh, I might think like, okay, what does it sound like if I took a, a group of seven notes, but played them in 16th notes, right? So it's just, so the first note keeps moving where it is in the pattern of 16th notes, right? So I think that's kind of a cool thing. And then and then I was like, okay, well, what seven note pattern am I going to do? And then what if I did a seven note pattern that went, and every every time I go through the pattern, I move up a little bit in the scale or I do this. And then it ends up creating this weird kind of thing that happens, like the soundscape. And it also, it's like an exercise for me to try and keep my orientation in time, even though these two times are fighting against each other, right? Wow. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, that's crazy. And in the course of doing that, I might kind of think, hey, that's a neat sound there i can make a lick out of this and i might tweak it and stop and start writing it um so that's kind of stuff i posted on on social media would be just like here's an exercise like when you're practicing you need to create exercises for yourself right like you figure out something you can't do or you try to play something and it's not working and then you have to stop and figure out okay where's the problem spot right and it's like oh man every time i slide my finger from here to here i'm rushing it or i'm missing it or i'm doing something so then you know that the finger slide is not your strength. So then you just make up something that is all finger slides. <laughs> right? So you're like, and you're, you just create a little repeated passage that you are forced to do that finger slide all the time and it can't hide. And eventually that finger slide becomes really strong. Right. Um, and so that's kind of like what I do is I just try and figure out what's the weak link here. And then I just try and go and just completely galvanize that chain, <laughs> that link in the chain. Right. And, uh, and fix it because there's always like usually when you can't get something, there's like one little piece of it that is screwing you up, right? Yeah. And and, wow. you, and rather than just do the whole thing over and over and over and over again, um, you really need to zero in on that one thing and create exercises that isolate it, right? And then force you to learn to do it uh, without being able to hide it amidst all the other stuff you do. Uh, and once it's you got it nailed, then you go back and put it in the main full piece and you try it, try it again and again. And, keep finding the weakest link and keep fixing it right so. wow that that you've like taught my class right there that is <laughs> that's amazing um because wh whenever you post this stuff like you were saying about the uh the different timing and working with these different uh timing does anyone pick up on that's what you're doing because when i look at it i just look at it and think like I, that's over my head. I'm looking at it and thinking, yeah. wow, look at how fast he's going. That sounds amazing. It's well, it, I would say probably most people don't pick it up, but also when I watch people that are doing stuff with time, I might not be able to say, Hey, that's seven over four or whatever. I can hear something's going on with the time. So I can hear that they're doing a polyrhythm of some kind, but um, yeah, it's just a matter of being able to hear it. And so um yeah, I would not expect that people could say, hey, he's doing seven over whatever. Like, I would have to stop and really listen to something to figure out what the exact subdivisions are. But you can just hear it. Usually something's going on there. Like, um, you can hear, hey, there's there's quintuplets in there or something. There's some kind of a displacement going on. And then you might have listened to it a few times to figure out what it is. But, hmm. but I think that's, the, like, the biggest thing that, differentiates people who can who sound good to people that don't sound good is how good their time is and because there's great guitar players who play a million miles an hour and there's terrible guitar players that play a million miles an hour and there's great guitar players that play like just a couple notes and there's lots of terrible guitar players that play just a couple notes so it's it's not about being able to play fast or a lot of notes but just being able to place the notes correctly in time 
right? Like not rushing and not having uneven timing and stuff like that. And and the most common thing people do is rush. Um, so that's a huge thing to work on. And the most useful way to work on that I found, aside from like, obviously you need to use a metronome for sure. But that what people tend to do is they, they uh, play triplets, for instance, right? Triplets is a group of three notes, right? But they play a three note pattern, right? Like if like they'll go A, B, C, A, B, C, or they'll go up, or they'll go up a scale in groups of three. And what happens is you're subdividing time in groups of three, and you're subdividing, you're group using note groupings of group of three. And what happens is you end up just being so blinkered by groups of three that what you don't realize you're doing is you're going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? They're not even triplets. You're not going triple it, triple it. You're going triplet, triplet. Right yeah. or trip bullet trip bullet right, and you don't even notice it because there's nothing showing that error in your time. Nothing's showing that to you. But if you pick a group of four notes, for instance, the first three notes are in the triplet, and the fourth note now is the first note of the next triplet. Right? Then that four note grouping starts on the second note of the triplet. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah, it's, I, I... yeah. So what happens is your ear is going to hear the triplet but your ear also has to listen to the four note pattern, right? And if you start going, da 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 and you're doing a four note pattern, it's gonna, you're gonna hear it, right? Okay. Because you're like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, right? Yeah. Instead of yeah. one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So when you're practicing subdivisions like a triplet or a 16th, as soon as you can get away from using the same note grouping as you have subdivision of time, if that okay. makes sense. If you're practicing sixteenth wow. notes, use a note grouping of three, or five, or seven, or anything, right? And then, and and vice versa. Just don't match them. It's just basically pick a fraction that doesn't divide into itself easily. <laughs> wow. So wow. does that make I sense? Think... I, sometimes I'm not sure I explain that well, but no, I, I I understand what when you were going through it and how to do it. I don't know that I would be able to show someone that, but I I fully understand in theory what you're saying there. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that might be a good lesson for the uh, more advanced guitar class instead of my <laughs> intro. <laughs> oh, yeah, That's probably not, you don't want to do that in the intro thing, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and this, I think uh, this next question kind of goes perfectly with practice, I think anyway. Um, a lot of people have performance anxiety and uh, playing in front of people. How do you, like, do I, I feel like I get anxious. I don't know if I get anxious if I'm doing a performance, but maybe it's like some nervous excitement. Um, but how would you overcome uh, being the the anxiety to be able to perform? Uh, I think there's no real easy answer. I mean, you can like breathe deep and like relax and do stuff like that. <laughs> um, those are all good things to do. But I think it comes down to just doing it and enough times that you get comfortable with it. Um, one trick I did find helpful actually was that after I had a particularly good gig, like where I played well and I felt good and stuff like that, I would remember what I did that day. And then I would just like, just anything, literally it could be like I uh, ate a burrito or I, whatever. Um, and then I would just do that again to try and cue myself into the same mental state. Or I used to do this. I don't do it anymore because I don't think I feel like I need it anymore, but if I was playing well and things were really flowing well and I wasn't, the nerves weren't screwing me up, I would just do something. And it used to be, I used to just knock on my guitar. So I used to just take my knuckle and I would knock a couple of times in the back of the guitar in between every song. And then I found that, at least I imagined that I could get myself into that headspace by doing the knock as well. Like it was kind of a thing that would cue that thing, but whether or not that worked or not, I don't know. Um, but I would say this, like if you're playing with other people, um, try to key on somebody else who has positive energy in your band. So, um, cause I struggled with that for a little while when I played out, I would just get into my head a little bit. I'd be playing and then I would mess up and then I would think, Oh man, this is terrible. And then I would just be, I would not enjoy it. And I was thinking, oh, God, people must be just thinking I'm just the worst. And I'm just, Oh, I screwed up again and it doesn't help. So, but I was playing with a drummer at the time. Um, who has just had the, had such fun playing, right? Every time I look back at him, he just was smiling and having a blast. And so I would make a point of turning around and looking and absorbing his energy, right? Like I would look at him and see what fun he was having. And I would just, and it would make me have fun. So 
Yeah. You definitely want to try and if somebody in your band is enjoying themselves or giving up positive energy, key off that. Um, other than that, you just kind of have to get out there and do it. Um, it's like exposure therapy, I guess. You just got to be <laughs> exposed to it. And eventually you don't, um, it doesn't bother you anymore. And then I guess also just observe the physical sensations of what you're feeling, right? Like, are you feeling energy? Are you feeling like butterflies in your stomach? And then just try to interpret that as not a negative thing, but a, a positive thing. Um, but I, also, I just found like the more I played live, eventually then it, I was honestly more comfortable on stage than I was off. I mean, <laughs> when you do it, like when you do it like day after day after day, like you go on a tour or something like that, it just becomes a thing where you're not nervous at all, but you are excited. Like you're having a fun yeah. time, but <clears throat> so, I mean, anybody who's watching you is probably rooting for you to do well. Right. So uh, you just kind of have to get up there and, and realize that even if you suck and you, totally screw up. It was worth it because you got through that one performance that's going to get you to the next one, which gets you to the next one. So. Yeah. 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 That's, I, I figured that that it, along those lines is what you were going to say. The more that you played kind of the, and the more you just get out there and do it. But I imagine there's still like those key moments opening at Massey Hall or, yeah. or something big like that, where a little bit of anxiety probably still jumps in uh, uh, it was actually that particular gig where I was definitely excited about. I don't think I was really, yeah, I was like super pumped up. And actually what happened at that gig was that after the first, I think it was midway through the second song, I realized that I was going to have to calm down because I was going to be out of breath. <laughs> yeah. I was just so pumped. And I was thinking like, I, have, I had to sing a couple of songs with really fast lyrics. And I was like, I realized part of through, like, like I was on the verge of like eventually being out of breath because I was just so, you know. Um, but in that instance, uh, we got a good positive reaction from the crowd. And then after like a couple songs, that ridiculous level of energy kind of settled down and it was still super exciting and we had a blast, but it felt like the danger of screwing up was over. Like it was kind of like, okay, they like us. We're good. We can settle in here, you know, and do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you probably, your first gigs out there, you probably want to pick something that's not ridiculously high pressure. I mean, you probably also don't want to go and play something that's at the limits of your ability right out of the gate, right? You don't want to like, um, and something that people will always find when they go out and play is that what you can do in the practice room doesn't translate perfectly to <clears throat> what you can do live, right? So um, especially when you're first starting out, you'll have something that you can just nail at home and then you go out and you don't understand why it didn't work, right? And part of that is playing with real people and not by yourself. Um, part of it is just the energy and the psychology of being out in a different environment in front of people. But um, that gets less and less and less as time goes on. So I wouldn't get discouraged. It's just a process that everybody has to go through. Um, I mean, I haven't played a gig now for it's going to be uh, since March, I guess. So I'm going to probably have to go through this again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I feel like a, a bunch of artists are going to be in that position where I don't know if they've been getting together and performing or even practicing over this yeah. long thing. And it might be a lot of sloppy bands when uh, <laughs> when, when concerts can come back. Yeah. Well, I, I've been practicing like crazy, but I haven't been oh. playing with anybody. So it's going to be, I'll just get my sea legs back again when I get back out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel bad because we're going on 45 minutes here and I told you to be quick. So that's all good, honestly. I'm I'm stuck in on the pandemic, so whatever you need, I'm good. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, is there any? I guess we'll, we'll kind of shape it here, fill in any holes that uh, we, I might have missed. But is there any key? I, I guess things that you could uh, that you haven't mentioned that you think a new guitar player should work on that want to make not maybe to to make guitar playing a career or uh like a little bit more than a hobby something uh, uh, to be in a band or something like that sure um well i think the biggest thing uh is to make sure that you're enjoying it still because um i mean i also was interested in drums when i was a kid and so my parents decided to take me for drum lessons and the drum teacher made me sit there with a single drum and play rudiments and at that stage of my like i was a little kid i wanted to get on a drum kit and make noise right yeah. And I, I just gave up the drums. It's like, no, I'm not going to do it. It's not my thing. Um, but 
I think if you're not enjoying it, like if you find that what you're doing is work and it's not fun, then you're not doing it right. Because generally people, people get good at things they do a lot and people do a lot things they enjoy, right? So yeah. that's why I play guitar as much as I do because I love it. Like I dig it. It's not like I'm in the practice room going, oh, this is a, such a bear. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, so there is work to be done for sure, but, um, and it's hard work, but it's, it's because you love it and you know what the reward will be. So I would say like learn songs that you like by artists you like. Don't go, don't let a teacher tell you that you, <clears throat> you have to learn some terrible song you hate, right? Like I, I had a teacher that just insisted um, that I learn classical stuff and he wouldn't, he didn't, hadn't even heard of ACDC when I was a kid. I was like, that was not the teacher for me, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I got obsessed with it because I really loved ACDC and I wanted to learn to play ACDC, right? If, if I was forced to practice, I don't know, something else, I probably wouldn't have taken it up. So make sure you enjoy what you're doing and have fun with it because you'll do it more and you'll be better at it. Uh, and the other thing is that like 10 minutes a day, five times a week is better than 50 minutes a day once, right? So, because the way you actually learn you do a lot of your learning overnight while you sleep, uh, actually. So like you, you during the day when you practice, you're challenging your brain, you're giving your brain challenges to try and figure out. And then when you sleep is when your brain kind of rewires itself and makes the connections to be better the next day, right? And so you come back to the practice room and you're different now. Your brain is kind of slightly changed to adapt to what you're trying to get it to do. And if you keep doing that on a regular basis, you'll progress. But if you decide I'm gonna practice for two hours today, and you don't practice for another week, uh, you're not going to progress as much. So I think doing it regularly is really important. And also, you'll build up your stamina in your hands and stuff so you won't get injuries. Um, because I think that's an important thing, too, that if you don't practice for a long time and all of a sudden go for two hours, you, you might screw up your hands, right? Um, yeah. And then I, I think the most important thing, too, is play with a metronome. What's going to differentiate you from other players? Because nobody pays attention to it when they start out is their time. And I, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but play to a metronome. Oh, and probably the most important thing is record yourself and listen to yourself. That's probably the most important thing. Because when you're playing, you cannot tell if you're out of time. You, people, you th like That's why people play at home and think they're good and then go out and play and they can't play with people because you don't hear what you're doing wrong. You need to listen to it objectively. So you got to play, listen back to it, and uh, and figure out what you're doing wrong. Try it again. Listen back to that. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, periods of development I ever went through was when I jammed with a friend of mine, played drums, and his cousin played bass. And we would record. We jammed for like an hour. And we recorded it on a, just on a crude tape, or, you know, a tape machine, or whatever. And then uh, we'd go hang out and we'd listen to it, right? And we we'd talk about what we were hearing and then we'd go back and we'd play again and we'd repeat this right we'd do it like three hours of playing and we'd listen back to it so if you're in a band with people too like do that record yourself on one microphone and do a crappy stereo whatever you want as long as you can hear it, it doesn't have to sound like recording go back and listen to it and then hear like oh man like i'm really rushing here or or you might hear what other people in the band are doing that you didn't catch because you were too focused on what you were doing yeah uh, and it's the best way to learn because you can actually get an objective view of or uh, listen of what you sound like. Um, so that's a huge thing to do for sure. Yeah. that As you were saying that, I, I was thinking, because with playing with uh, Cyanide Kiss and Robot Apocalypse and things yeah. like that, the one thing I noticed, I, I started adding like a, a drum and bass sequencer just because okay. I've had the stuff. So I started playing around and, and listening to it. And what I noticed is uh, together as a, and, and this is just your personal opinion, I don't know. Uh, I'm just interested for my own learning now. Yeah. Um, we can play together as a band, but even the drummer like speeds up and slows down yeah. as, he gets, as he gets into it. And we've always thought of that as a good thing. But as we try and play to a drum sequencer, which is at... I don't know, 120 beats per minute or something like that. Yeah. We we get quieter and we hear, oh, we've gone off time from <laughs> that. Like now we got to stop and then get back in. Do you think yeah. it, that we should be more uh, 
uh, regimented or do you no, think no, no. That no. It, there's nothing wrong with that like so when i say play to a metronome i don't mean that every single time you go and play music for an artistic expression you should have a tempo that never changes but what you should be able to do is know where it is that's what the metronome was for right so a metronome was like a reference track so that when you practice you can realize where where the time is and you can lock in if you're playing in a band, it sounds better. Like you get ex energetic parts of the music, the tempo will go up a bit and that's good, right? Like it's good to go up a bit in the chorus or whatever, you know, like the tempo is a thing that is a way of expression, just like volume or pitch or anything like that. So it's not like you, and playing to a click is actually challenging for bands to do and not necessarily ideal. Like there's great bands that their, their tempo fluctuates. That's not a bad thing as long as you're together, I guess. But just that what you don't want to do is um, is rush things when you don't mean to and and not necessarily even speeding up the tempo, but just all of a sudden the band's playing and all of a sudden you're way ahead of them. Yeah. Right? And that yeah. tends to happen with guitar players, especially when they try to play fast. The ironic thing about playing fast is that in order to do it well, you really have to think slow. Like as soon as you get into, if your brain, if what you're thinking keep speeding up with the notes it's just like for some reason it's just the most common thing is just to rush and rush and rush and it's really difficult to relax and play fast but not get into a frantic state of mind right so keeping good time while playing fast is tough but no i i would never say all great bands the best bands in the world speed up and slow down when they play live to a degree right like um yeah so if it sounds good, it is good. That's that's the only rule. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's awesome. Like I feel like all that stuff that you talked about is amazing stuff. Uh, yeah. That a lot of it, I don't think I would have even touched upon it. So I'm glad that we kind of went through all that. Um, just the only, the, only other, the only other one thing I would say too is, since it's a beginning guitar thing, is I would say just don't get discouraged. Like be, just because it's lots of times you'll think something seems totally impossible and you will be able to do it if you just practice it. You will be like, if you see something and you, uh, and you think, oh, I'll never do it. I can't get my fingers. To, you'd be surprised how much your fingers will change what they can do. And, mm -hmm. and eventually what you thought was impossible is going to be like, just, eh, I could just, it's not a big deal anymore. Right. So just give, let the process work keep practicing regularly and you'll be surprised that you know what you can actually learn to do awesome yeah that's awesome so post uh post covid do you think there will be when do you think shows will come back well, i don't know i still have friends here that are gigging right now. oh really yeah and i've i had offered gigs here a few times um and i've turned them all down because i just don't want to risk it um we're being pretty like locked down here. Um, but yeah, I got friends that are out playing gigs still. Like some of them are outdoors. One of them's not. It's an indoor place. But I think people maybe have to wear masks and stay apart or something. But um, I don't know what's going to happen because a lot of these venues are like, they probably have lost so much money that when they do come back, are they going to have to like pay even less just to make ends meet? And Yeah. So, well, you're from around here. Uh, well, you used to be. Uh, Chainsaw went under and and starlight went under so I think, yeah i think i saw the starlight one. and yeah. what else did, uh some other place did too i don't Wasn't know if you're... yeah sorry there's been a bunch of a couple of few in toronto as well closed yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah i don't know like all those venues close and then when the when things come back who's gonna open up new ones i don't know like yeah i don't know uh, i'm not yeah. sure it's we'll it's pretty, it's pretty depressing, man. But um, you just never know. I don't know. I, ho hopefully, it'll happen. I just had I got an email today that uh, the I had a gig at a festival in the UK, and uh, that got canceled last year, so it was pushed to this year, and they've just canceled this year, so they're pushing it to next year. <laughs> so it was annoying. I had a tour, like I had like a fifteen date, thirteen or fifteen date tour in the UK booked. And then I had a tour out through Quebec, including a couple of festivals out through Eastern Canada. And then I was going to road it back down through Maine and New York state. And I had a, also had one in like St. Louis and Kentucky, a little run down there, all these things. I had to cancel everything. Wow. It's just like, it sucks, but yeah. Yeah. So. 
But I'm practicing a ton, so at least that's there's that. You know? Well, thank you so much. That was awesome. Actually, before you go, I'm going to stop the recording here just so that it